Well, welcome to the first Mattingly Lecture of the new academic year. I'm Rebecca Lingwood, the Director of the Institute of Continuing Education here at Mattingly Hall. And first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our chair for this evening, Brian Eversham, uh, so that he may introduce our speaker, Professor Andrew Barnford, and chair the questions at the end of the lecture. Brian Eversham is Chief Executive of the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire. For 13 years till 2010, he was Conservation Director responsible for nature reserves, wider countryside conservation and training. And he introduced landscape scale conservation to the Trust. In 2007, Brian was seconded to the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts and has chaired the national team guiding Living Landscapes Initiative. Previously, at the National Biological Records Centre, Brian managed around 15,000 volunteers, gathering data on approximately 10,000 species. He has interests ranging from birds to mollusks and much in between. And if that weren't enough, he is author of The Atlas of the Dragonflies of Britain and Ireland, and is author of over 200 scientific papers and reports. So, just before I hand over to Brian, can I remind you that if you've brought your mobile phones or other things that have ringing tones on them, this is the moment to switch them off. Thank you very much. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Rebecca. I don't think, as a chair, I've ever been introduced in such detail before. This is... Good evening and welcome to the latest Maddingly Lecture. I have to say it's a great honour to be chairing one of these events. It's a very important series of public lectures and every speaker in the series is a leading authority in their field. I'm delighted this evening to be introducing Andrew Barnford, the Professor of Conservation Science in the Zoology Department here in Cambridge. As many of you will have read in the um, programme for this evening, Andrew's major contribution has been around tackling the fundamental questions about the relationship between people and nature and the global loss of nature um, on this planet and answering challenging questions like, is conservation worthwhile? Why is nature being lost? How much is conservation going to cost and how do we achieve it efficiently? Now, tackling urgent, challenging questions like that is hugely difficult when the available data around which to analyze challenging questions often lags way, way behind the needs of the researchers. And I think Andrew's great contribution to date has been leading that movement, valuing nature, making the best use of available information to give us answers now, rather than to start long-term studies that may possibly give us answers in decades to come, by which time it may be too late. And also, I think Andrew is fundamentally recognizing that conservation of the environment is not an alternative to human, uh, human well-being, but is actually the basis of human well-being. And finally, before I hand over to Andrew, uh, noting that he's recently written a book which is available this evening, I have to say for someone so close to the global cutting edge in environmental con um, conservation, to write a book called Wild Hope I think should give us all some encouragement. And I'm hoping that this evening will be um, stimulating and encouraging at least as much as it may also be depressing. So, Andrew, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for those um, kind words. And, and thank you, Rebecca, for uh, organising uh, this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you for, um, for turning out. Um, it's uh, really nice to see so many people and so many familiar faces as well. That's, um, it's quite a relief, actually. <laughs> to put it bluntly, nature is in serious trouble and it's our fault. Since the rise of agriculture, we've removed roughly around a half of wild habitats and the populations of animals and plants that depend on them. Although the numbers are still noisy, it seems we're losing what's left at somewhere between a half and one and a half percent a year. According to the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, more than four-fifths of all the world's fish stocks are now fully or over-exploited. 
Since 1970, populations of Africa's spectacular mammals, so it's elephants, it's zebras, it's antelope, have more than halved, and that's inside the parks that have been set up to protect them. Outside, they've often all but disappeared. Overall, we've elevated extinction rates to roughly a thousand times the average so-called background rates at which species typically disappear from the fossil record. And more than one in five of all uh, species on the planet are now reckoned to be in danger of extinction in the near to medium future. And things aren't getting any better. 2010 was the year by which the world's governments pledged that they would have slowed the rate of biodiversity loss. But as these plots show, and these are the results from the Convention on Biological Diversity's 2010 scorecard, forests, seagrass beds and mangroves, those are the only habitats whose extent is tracked at a global scale, they've continued to shrink. And the condition of coral reefs isn't getting any better either. These lower plots here uh, show trends in populations uh, of different groups of organisms. Uh, the most comprehensive by far is the Living Planet Index, the LPI there at the bottom. Uh, and you can see again that things are generally in sustained decline. Overall, 8 out of 10 of the global indicators of the state of nature, so the amount of nature, have continued uh, to decline, mostly at the same rate as in the 1990s. And that's really no surprise, because all five of the indicators of the pressure that we're putting on natural systems have continued to increase. Now, this grim litany will be all too familiar, I'm sure, and it raises some serious questions that I want to explore. So why is it happening, and why does it matter? We live in a world with many other pressing problems. So why should the continuing demise of wild places and the creatures that live there be a priority? Again, the arguments I'll make will be familiar to, to most of you. But after that, in the bulk of my talk, I want to do something that you might uh, just find surprising. I want to see whether the picture, in fact, might not be quite so unremittingly gloomy and consider instead whether there are any glimmers of hope. So rather than focusing solely on nature's decline, I want to examine, albeit in an anecdotal way, some success stories where things are getting better rather than worse. And then I'll try and see what, if anything, these examples teach us about how to improve the overall success rate of conservation interventions. And finally, I'll try to assess what all this means about prospects for nature over the next century or so. So... Is nature's rapidly draining glass half empty, or is it in any way half full? So, turning to my first uh, question, why is it happening? We need to uh, understand what's causing the loss of nature, really at two levels. The immediate processes that are causing things to die out, and the underlying drivers behind those processes. The threatening processes are a pretty familiar bunch. And the greatest of those is habitat loss. We've cleared wild habitats on land to make way for farming and forestry and our infrastructure. And now, through damaging fishing techniques in particular, we're doing the same sort of thing at sea. One well-documented example is Dorset Heathland, which formed the backdrop to uh, most of Thomas Hardy's novels and whose decline he was already mourning by the end of the 19th century. This man here is one of my heroes. I know many of you know him. He's pioneering uh, British conservationist Norman Moore. And in what I think was one of the earliest quantitative analyses of habitat loss, Norman's reconstructed maps showed that Heathland clearance, if anything, accelerated after Hardy's time, particularly uh, after World War II, with government grants and afforestation programmes encouraging farming and tree planting, even in areas where low soil fertility meant it was wholly uneconomic. And worldwide, habitat loss uh, at sea, as I mentioned, as well as on land, remains the single greatest threat to nature. Alongside it, We've consistently harvested and hunted wild populations, 
at a higher rate than they can sustain. We've spread very many species to new places where they sometimes eat or outcompete or cause disease in native species. Just one example is the fungus that causes the disease chytridiomycosis, uh, which is thought to be responsible for the extinction of dozens of amphibians over the past 20 years, apparently including the remarkable gastric brooding frogs of eastern Queensland. If you can see this Russian doll arrangement here, these used to um, be able to uh, brood their young in their stomachs of all places. And the physiology behind that, sadly, will now remain forever um, uh, uh, a mystery because, uh, as I say, they've gone extinct, apparently because of chytridiomycosis. Alongside these well-established threats, new threats are emerging as well. Human-driven changes to the climate have been estimated as being likely to commit between a fifth and a third of all species to extinction by 2050. Eutrophication from nitrogen originating in fertilisers is bringing about fundamental changes to many low-nutrient lake systems. It's causing harmful algal blooms in marine and freshwater. And our emissions of carbon dioxide, a quarter of which get absorbed by the sea, where they form carbonic acid, they're now on such a scale that they're shifting the pH of the oceans as a whole. Many marine scientists consider that by 2050, seawater may be too acidic for many creatures to build their calcium carbonate shells. So much marine life, from reef building corals to photosynthetic plankton, might quite literally dissolve. What about the underlying drivers behind these threats? Well, to my mind, these come in four main flavours. Most straightforwardly, perhaps most obviously, there's the size of our population. We took almost all of human history to reach the one billion mark sometime in the early 1800s. But recently, our population has been growing uh, at around one billion people every 13 years. Even though growth is now slowing, with world population set to peak at somewhere around 10 billion in around 2050, we're still expanding by the equivalent of the combined population of Athens and Nairobi, or if you prefer, uh, the total population of Scotland and Birmingham, every single month. Second, there's our unquenchable demand for higher standards of living. Now, that's essential, of course, for much of the world's population, but I think it's far more questionable among the rest of us. This is even more important if you do the sums, uh, though it's less comfortable for the comfortably off uh, to contemplate than is population growth. Total population is likely to rise by roughly 50% between 2000 and 2050. But per capita consumption is forecast to grow more than fourfold. So its impacts uh, on total consumption far outstrip those of growth in the number of people doing the consuming. Then there's the problem that when we make choices, we tend to put ourselves above people elsewhere and above future generations. And this is particularly bad news for conservation because the benefits of conserving somewhere are often externalities. So they accrue to people other than those in charge of an area, and they tend to build up only over the long term. So people will typically discount them, not just in their heads, but on their balance sheets, in favour of more immediate returns today. And last on my uh, list is our growing disconnect from nature. We live in a rapidly urbanising society, where for the first time, more than half of humanity now works and plays and sleeps in towns and cities. And as a consequence, many argue that we're losing touch with wild creatures and wild places. Yet how can we be expected to care about what we no longer experience, what we no longer know? Nature's erosion may ultimately be driven as much by our indifference as by our, in, uh, as by our direct actions. So nature's in a pretty sorry state, and it seems uh, clear that we're to blame. But does nature's demise really matter in any real sense for us as people? Well, in broad terms, 
There are two main arguments, I think, for conservation, for trying to do something. And first, there's the argument, which I suspect is important for many of us in this room, which says that limiting the loss of nature is simply the right thing to do. We should leave the world uh, in at least no worse a state than we first find it. Now, for some people, that's largely a moral argument. For others, it's expressed perhaps in uh, religious terms. For me, it's about a sense of wonder in nature's marvels. What makes me a passionate conservationist is the desire that my children uh, and your children and their children, in turn, can have the same opportunities to be amazed and humbled by nature as I have. But there are powerful material arguments for conservation too. We all of us benefit from nature in terms of our immediate day-to-day -day well-being through what in the jargon are called ecosystem services. Sometimes those benefits are relatively obvious. They're the physical goods such as fish or timber or medicines that we harvest directly from the wild. But many other ecosystem services are less tangible and harder to see uh, because they benefit us only indirectly and unlike the goods I was just talking about, they don't pass through conventional economic mar markets. So one example would be the role in climate regulation of the great planktonic soup of the world's oceans, much of it living in those pH sensitive uh, shells. Phytoplankton not only soak up carbon dioxide, but as this um, immense planktonic buildup off the coast of Alaska, uh, this is Alaska here, this is a huge planktonic buildup off the coast. As this shows, uh, plankton can reflect sunlight back into space, so cooling the planet, and they even release into the air particles of dimethyl sulfide around which clouds then begin to form. There's increasing evidence too of the role of green space in enhancing our physical and psychological uh, well-being. So for instance, a recent experiment from the States, which I find absolutely amazing, shows that simply having four pot plants in a room instead of just a desk and a computer significantly changes the relative importance which in quick surveys of attitudes, psychology undergraduates, and of course it's always psychology undergraduates in these sorts of surveys, the importance which psychology undergraduates uh, attach to relationships and community, so family and friends, compared with fame and fortune. So if that's the effect of just having three or four pot plants uh, next to your computer, imagine the consequences of losing uh, contact with nature as a whole. Other largely unseen services include habitats absorbing the impact of storms, wild insect pollinators fertilising many of our crops, and a whole host of species holding various diseases in check. Now, estimating the value of these services, uh, the services that we're losing through the erosion of nature, is extremely hard. These things are very difficult to value at all precisely. But there's increasing agreement that the cost to society as a whole is very large indeed. These are three estimates of the long-term cost of just a single year's loss of nature worldwide. And they're all coming in in the trillions of dollars. So in terms of thousands of billions of dollars from each year's loss. Big numbers like this are all very well, but what do they, these losses look like on the ground and in human terms? Well, they look like what's been happening in South Asia, where the deregulation of the veterinary drug diclofenac inadvertently caused the poisoning of tens of millions of vultures uh, that feed on dead cattle, but are also unusually sensitive to diclofenac, leading to a loss of the free waste disposal service that all those uh, vultures provided. A huge build-up of cattle carcasses, grave uh, fears about outbreaks of disease, even a schism uh, in a religion, the Parsis, over how they should now go about disposing of their dead, as there are now too few vultures in India to pick over their corpses in traditional towers of silence. And the loss of ecosystem services is equally manifest in the southern United States, where decades of drainage have removed tens of thousands of square kilometres of coastal wetlands that used to buffer human settlements from the impacts 
of hurricanes. Here you can see Katrina, uh, just before she made landfall, and we know what happened to an area stripped of its defensive wetlands after that. And in a less dramatic but more widespread way, the loss of those protection services impacts just about all of us through the long-term rise in the costs of insurance. Earlier this year, Lloyds of London announced record insurance payments. I'm willing to bet they'll be higher still uh, in 2013. And we all pay more in our premiums as the insurance companies pass on to their customers the costs of escalating damage from increasingly frequent storms and floods. So the bad news is that nature is indeed in serious trouble. And the really bad news is that one way or another, this is harming all of us. But are there any bits of good news? Places where, despite growing pressures, conservation efforts have meant that the loss of nature has been slowed or even reversed. Focusing in on those successes, understanding them and celebrating them, could be extremely valuable, I think, um, for two reasons. And the first, the first is that, if we're honest about it, many, perhaps most, conservation efforts aren't working as well as we'd like. We're winning some battles, but we're plainly losing the war. But maybe by trying to examine some of conservation successes in more detail, we can understand a bit better what they're doing right so that future efforts can score, can score more hits and uh, fewer misses. A second reason for thinking positively is that in selling the bad news to people quite so effectively, conservationists may have overlooked the vital importance of convincing people that there are solutions. We've made people painfully aware, but we've then given them no prospect that things can be turned around. We've given them just a dismal choice between despair and denial. Maybe conservation is missing a trick. So consider, of all things, Red Nose Day. And that raises around £80 million every two years for humanitarian projects, and all focused around just one evening. So whatever way you look at it, that's highly effective campaigning. It's worth asking how they managed to do it. Well, like many people, I don't think much about uh, comic relief until on my way home uh, on the evening, some otherwise presumably sane individual, uh, dressed up for the night as a rabbit, accosts me for my small change. But after a couple of hours of watching amusing TV sketches interspersed with a heart-rending plea or two, I've picked up the phone and I've pledged the family silver. Why do I do that? Well, I think it's because the format immediately follows up desperately moving films about AIDS victims or street children with uplifting sequences showing where my money went last time, showing me that something can be done, that my contribution right now can make a difference. And maybe telling good news as well as bad news makes sense for conservation too. And the good news is that despite all I've been saying, there are a growing number of conservation successes. Going back to the example of uh, the Dorset Heathlands, 20 years after Norman Moore documented their sustained decline, attitudes to the environment had changed. Government had by now decided that public access and enjoyment were more important priorities than unprofitable plantations. And so its foresters began working with conservationists to return large areas of conifers back into heathland. Trees uh, were removed, seeds that were long dormant in the seed bank started germinating, and birds and insects and reptiles spread out from the tiny fragments that people like Norman had had the foresight to save. And as a result, uh, my friend Norman, perhaps the first person to chart the decline of a habitat, has lived long enough and worked hard enough to see his curve of loss... Oops to see his curve of loss down here just starting to tilt upwards. And so, prompted by the comic relief bunny and spurred on by the example of the Dorset Heathlands, I started uh, trying to put together a whole book about conservation successes. I asked friends to send me their good news stories and eventually catalogued dozens of them. 
And then to find out more, to check they were really as good as they seemed, and to learn a bit about what made them work, I got a grant from the Leverhulme Trust, and I picked a handful to go and visit. So in Kazaranga National Park in Assam, I learnt how very traditional so-called fortress and fines conservation, literally nightly gun battles between park rangers and armed poaching gangs, coupled with local people's exceptional cultural tolerance of large and dangerous animals, have together worked to protect and dramatically increase a highly vulnerable population of Indian rhinos in the, fa in, the face, in the face of very lucrative poaching, despite the area being politically unstable and despite the park having more than 70,000 very poor people living on its immediate doorstep. In extreme western Ecuador, I learnt from a talismanic village elder called Don Alejandro Ramirez how local people there finally brought to an end 50 years of clearance of hilltop forests that in around 70 square kilometres are home to over 70 narrowly distributed so-called restricted range bird species. Just um, for context, that's more in those 70 square kilometres than there are more than three times as many as there are of, the, of these high priority bird species across the whole of Europe, uh, North Africa and the Middle East put together. So it's an exceptionally important uh, part of the world. But the villagers chose to conserve uh, their forest not because of conventional conservation arguments that the place was biologically uh, extraordinary. For over a decade, those arguments had failed. But instead, they did so because a lateral thinking ecologist called Dusty Becker had looked at what the forests did for local people. And working with them, she discovered that they play a vital role in intercepting fog rolling off the Pacific during the dry season. And so they act as an essential source of water for downstream farmers. Soon after seeing the numbers, the villagers declared a thousand hectares of their land as an ecological reserve. So what conventional conservation exhortations had failed to achieve in more than a decade, the focus on fog delivered in less than three months. In the Netherlands, I found out about that country's extraordinary plans, which are still more or less on track, to return one-sixth of the land surface to nature by creating new habitats, by taking down dikes, restoring natural floodplains, and crucially, linking all the components together through a network of corridors, even building uh, so-called eco-ducts. I don't know if you can see this clearly, but eco-ducts, vast green bridges across the country's uh, motorways and uh, railways so that wildlife can pass from one side to the other. The entire enterprise is costing around a billion euros each year, but it's survived successive changes of government uh, in the Netherlands because politicians are consistently persuaded that despite its cost, it's actually very good value for money. Not just in terms of its benefits for wildlife, but because of its benefits for people. Land under nature soaks up rather than emits carbon. It stores flood water and so prevents damage to infrastructure. And it provides space in a country where the number one health problem is recognised as stress, space where people can simply go and relax and unwind. The penultimate story I want to talk about comes from Western Australia, where uh, the world's largest deposit of bauxite which is the ore that we ultimately get aluminium from, unfortunately lies underneath almost the whole of a very unusual and highly species-rich eucalypt system called Jarrah Forest. And the problem is that the only way to mine bauxite is to clear fell the forest, take off the topsoil and then cart away the rock. In 1961, when Alcoa, uh, the, the biggest bauxite company in the region, won its 84-year concession, all that it was legally required to do was then put the topsoil back on, bung in a few non-native uh, tree saplings, and walk away. That, of course, didn't work. They blew over um, in the first, uh, first storm. That didn't matter in, terms, in the legal terms of Alcoa's lease. But quite remarkably, and way ahead of their time, this was the late 1960s, early 70s, Alcoa started becoming concerned about public opinion. 
And they recognised that what really mattered for the long-term future of their lease was not what the law said now, but what people would think about what they did 20 or 30 years into the future. So they hired psychologists and market researchers who told them that that was likely to be, of all things, the environment. If Alcoa didn't pay attention to the environment now, they could in future lose their highly profitable concession, no matter how lax uh, the formal legal terms of their agreement. And so they decided, quite simply, to become the best mine restoration company in the world. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to find out how best to store and return the topsoil and the seed bank that it contained, how to harvest extra seeds before clearance and sow them afterwards, how to clone dozens of species that are very reluctant to germinate from seeds, and so on. And the results are extraordinarily impressive. Alcoa is now regrowing Jarrah at the same rate uh, as they're clearing it. Uh, this uh, shows what the forest looks like uh, 20 years uh, after uh, clearance. They got to the stage by 2001 that the average number of plant species in their post-restoration plots started to exceed the average number in the same area before the bulldozers uh, moved in. And most importantly, all of that's been achieved not by a conservation organisation, without a penny of conservation money, but by one of the world's biggest uh, mining corporations. My last example comes from the sea. And it again illustrates the power of people working outside conventional conservation. And it involves, of all things, a tuna fishery. Albacore is a medium-sized open ocean predator, and like other tuna, it's vulnerable to being overfished through fishing methods like long lining, purse seining, and illegal high seas drift netting. But one small fishery based out of the west coast of the United States, which calls itself the American Albacore Fisheries Association, or AFA, still uses traditional methods of trolling, which involves a very short line with a single hook on it, and poling, where single fish are caught on rods. And these methods, unlike uh, the others, are highly selective. They only catch a small portion of each shoal that is encountered, and there's essentially zero bycatch of non-target species. Like many other fisheries, it's also quite dangerous. It involves going out for many weeks into the middle of the Pacific in boats that are just 60 foot long, so not much longer than this uh, room. And when you finally find a shoal, you have to stand up uh, to your waist in a mesh basket at the back of the boat in a pitching sea. So this guy's up to his knees and it'll drop and come back up again. In a pitching sea in the middle of the Pacific, um, catching and then throwing over your shoulder seven or eight kilogram fish and you can go and watch a video of this. They, when, they're on a, when they're on a shoal, they'll be landing them at the rate of about 10 a minute. And they've got to do all of this without uh, hitting the person next door. I was really keen when I went to see the fishery to go out with them uh, and experience albacore fishing for myself. But they took one look at me and said, we don't think that's a good idea. You might not come back. <laughs> so landing the fish is tricky enough. But the real problem for the fishermen of AFA is that they've been undercut in the American canned tuna market by the huge quantities of tuna being offloaded by unsustainable long lining and purse seining boats. And as a result, they've seen the prices they get uh, for their fish plummeting and they're fast going out of business. That was until 2007, when after a lengthy process of independent assessment, a remarkable initiative called the Marine Stewardship Council certified the AFA fishery as being sustainably managed. So AFA products can now carry uh, the MSC's uh, certification label, which you can find on lots of products, uh, wherever you uh, buy your fish, you can find this uh, symbol. And the AFA fishermen, as a result, uh, can get premium prices for their fish by selling them to conservation-conscious retailers uh, in Europe. This is only one small uh, fishery, of course, but it's one of over 300 now certified or being assessed uh, by the MSC, which seems to be making a difference, not just in conservation terms, but in human terms as well. As one generation, one third generation AFA fisherman said to me, at long last, there's some hope that we have a future and that my son can go into fishing and carry on the family tradition. <laughs> 
So those are some brief examples of good news stories. Of course, like all the case studies I visited, these successes are not uh, certain. Some of them may well fall apart. They all have their limitations and their wrinkles. That's what makes them interesting. And they're unrepresentative of conservation as a whole. They're the result of very deliberate uh, cherry picking. But although they may be in the minority, many conservation projects do succeed. Each dot uh, on this map is a success story that I looked at in one way or another for my book. So what between them do all these examples uh, tell us? Well, first, they show that conservation can succeed. And that's not to say it usually does. I think most conservation interventions are, are less successful and many are outright failures. But many do succeed. And that success clearly isn't confined to one particular set of favourable conditions or tractable problems. I chose several of my stories specifically because they appeared to be making headway despite unpromising situations. Expanding space for nature in an already crowded country like uh, the Netherlands. Curbing lucrative poaching in a desperately poor land plagued by stop-start armed insurrection, uh, and so on. Second, uh, the successes I've looked at all illustrate how conservation itself is changing. Approaches and motives have broadened from traditional preservation of nature for its own sake, as with Kaziranga's rhinos, to securing sustained harvests of wild-caught goods, through to safeguarding and restoring healthy ecosystems because of other less tangible benefits to people, uh, like more water uh, when it's dry, uh, less risk of flooding when it's wet, or space where people can simply relax. And the cast of people involved in conservation has correspondingly broadened too, beyond just rangers and lawyers and scientists, to include farmers and planners, engineers, in many cases consumers and corporations. So in the jargon, conservation is slowly becoming mainstreamed. Third, in conservation, one size does not fit all. So while a bottom-up, community-driven approach was obviously pivotal to progress in Loma Alta, Kaziranga reinforces the point that Asia's rhinos survive nowhere without armed protection and strong enforcement of the law. And likewise, while government's been an essential driving force for change uh, in the Netherlands, success in Alcoa's mines and the American albacore the American Albacore fleet has been achieved almost entirely through a combination of private enterprise and NGO pressure. And from what I've seen, those who advocate on ideological grounds this or that singular approach uh, to conservation risk narrowing the opportunities for it, for it to succeed. Last, even though the examples I've looked at are pretty varied, there are a number of themes that are repeatedly associated with success. So nearly all the stories I learnt, uh, I learnt about involve taking a long-term view, hanging on despite setbacks, and recognising that success requires both time and adequate funding. Regrowing complex forests or reinstating nature across a crowded country are things that don't come quickly or cheap. Several projects, like Loma Alta, were apparently helped by operating in communities with fair and transparent ways of reaching decisions. Many others depended on having a strong regulatory and legislative framework for conservation, which itself was often the product of sustained lobbying by politically savvy NGOs. Many of the successes uh, I visited worked in part because they dared to think big. Their proponents dreamed of a nature network spanning a whole country, of a restored forest every bit as rich as what went before, or of a certification scheme in the case of the Marine Stewardship Council that might one day extend to one-fifth of all the world's wild-caught fish. Many showed the power of what you might call a Goldilocks-sized portion of research. Not so much science uh, as for it to be an excuse to delay action, but enough to identify a problem, diagnose its likely cause, and then monitor the effectiveness of an intervention and guide necessary changes in management. 
Just about all the efforts I looked at have their flaws. The measures needed to save Kaziranga's rhinos raise real worries about the human costs of conservation. Many projects suffer from a real lack of monitoring and so on. Conservation has obviously always got to recognise its shortcomings and strive to do better. But improving things as you go along is very different uh, to not starting them at all because they're not perfect. Two other features characterise just about all the cases uh, I uh, examined. Every story I visited succeeded in no small measure because of remarkable uh, leadership. Long-sighted individuals like Norman Moore in Dorset, who foresaw a different world where concerns for nature and calls for its conservation would grow. Independent thinkers like Dusty Becker, the researcher at the heart of the fog story. Key early adopters like her colleague Don Alejandro, so pioneers in villages, but also in business and in government. And energetic and inspiring doers who took on daunting tasks and made things work. And last, many of these architects thought creatively. Rather than focusing solely on the difficulties facing threatened creatures and places, they looked at the challenges facing ordinary people. What mattered to them? How could their problems be addressed? By taking this broader view, these pioneers found new ways around seemingly intransigent problems. Conservation needs all the friends it can get and broad imaginative thinking, using, among other things, the insights gained from recognising the importance of ecosystem services, seems a powerful way of finding them. So what does all this mean for the future of nature? Is there a chance that most of the extraordinary fabric of the living world could persist? Or is nature's continued demise utterly unavoidable? Well, from what I've seen, a great deal of nature could be saved, but whether it will be depends. It depends on how much we want it and on the decisions that we make really over the next quarter century. Looked at objectively, the situation is extremely serious. The threats I started off talking about are grave and growing. New challenges are emerging. And these different threats are interacting with one another and on top of that, we can expect the unexpected, non-linear changes in the way that natural systems respond to increasing pressures, perhaps even tipping points. Like most conservationists I've asked, I think we have at most one generation left to turn things around. With about half of wild nature already gone, roughly 1% of what's left being cleared or caught or displaced each year, I reckon that in a couple of decades from now, the unravelling will have become irreparable. To stop this, we already have a pretty good idea about the sorts of conservation interventions which will be required on the ground. Nature reserves that are bigger, better connected and better protected. Much greater self-restraint in how we exploit forests and fisheries and increasingly the world's dwindling supplies of fresh water far more serious efforts to limit the spread of invasive species and drastic reining in of our greenhouse gas and reactive nitrogen emissions. And I think these sorts of changes in the way we treat the environment won't happen without much more fundamental transformations in how we live our lives. Having fewer children, especially in richer countries where individuals consume so much more, greatly reducing our use of fossil fuels. In wealthier countries, seriously lowering our consumption of meat and dairy goods so that the food that we need can be grown on less land. Curbing our seemingly insatiable appetite for ever more stuff. The latest fashions, the shiniest gizmos. Mortgaging the planet's future to meet basic human needs is one thing, but doing so in order to consume yet more trivia strikes me as something completely different. And most difficult but fundamental of all, I believe we need to replace the prevailing global model of indefinite resource-based economic growth. 
This may have been tenable in the 19th and early 20th centuries when you could be forgiven for thinking that the Earth's resources were boundless. But to continue clinging to that idea in today's so evidently finite world seems to me desperately unimaginative. These are major changes. They challenge our core values and expectations. And they're unsettling even to contemplate. If they happen at all, they'll take time. But I can think of three reasons for remaining at least somewhat optimistic. And the first is that these changes are also essential for tackling the two other great crises of our age, human-driven changes to the global climate and the wretched poverty of many in the developing world. If we're to succeed on climate change, on poverty or in conservation, then we need to start work now on addressing their common root causes. Second, while nature is in very serious trouble, roughly half of it still remains. Nature's glass is more or less half full. And that gives us time. Not much time, but a little bit. And third, the places and people that I've been lucky enough to encounter have convinced me that we already have both the wit and the will to slow down nature's loss very considerably. We know some of the things that we need to do to increase the success rate of conservation efforts so that there are more hits and fewer misses. And often, more often than we might think, the will is there too. Whether that's the Assamese people's tolerance of Kaziranga's rhinos or the Dutch politicians' recognition that nature conservation is not just for the birds, but is good for people too. So I don't think nature's unrelenting decline is inevitable. Conservation does not run counter to the wider economic interests of society at large. Alcoa isn't going bust. The Dutch National Ecological Network hasn't damaged the Netherlands' credit rating. Instead, conservation enriches rather than diminishes the human enterprise. And there is still an enormous amount of nature left to fight for. And given all that, I think there are genuine grounds uh, for hope. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Andrew. I think that was more than I was hoping for. Um, my, my sense is that's the biggest challenge I've faced for many a long year. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So, um, since we have an audience downstairs as well in this room, we do need the microphones to get to you before we ask questions. So, questions, please. Thank you very much for a very inspirational lecture. Um, some time ago, you expressed the hope to create a Pokemon-like game to engage and excite <laughs> children. I have an eight-year-old grandson and wonder whether you've succeeded in doing so because I think the whole thing needs to start with children. Thank you. Uh, thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, this, this was an exercise we did a few years back with some undergraduates um, where, uh, and, and a lot of local school children where I was getting distressed that um, uh, some of my children's friends didn't seem to know very much about natural history but knew an awful lot about Pokemon. We went out into local schools and asked children what they knew about uh, those two, about um, 100 species of Pokemon, which ones they could put a name to, which ones they knew anything about, and 100 species, uh, we didn't ask them 100 questions, obviously they had a pool, but um, we asked these kids uh, what they knew about uh, local natural history as well. And distressingly we found that on the one hand when uh, the children got to school when they were um, four, five, six, they knew uh, quite a lot of natural history. They could get about 30% of things like uh, bluebells and oak trees and otters and so on named, which was fantastic. And they didn't know very much about Pokemon, but by the time they got to about eight or nine, they'd forgotten most of their natural history and they knew a lot more about Pokemon. And by the time they were about nine or ten, they could get 100% of Pokemon species absolutely right and uh, didn't know very much about oak trees. Um, so that was the, 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 the prompt. And it was a wish at the end of the paper that um, perhaps somebody would do that. And I'm glad to say actually somebody has. So there's a group in... Um, uh, in uh, in Canada, uh, out of the University of British Columbia, who've created something called Philomon, P-H-Y-L-O-Mon, uh, which is uh, an online trading game uh, which involves natural history, and which, uh, among other things, tries to encourage 
uh, local groups to create their own sets of cards that are relevant to them and then post them online and so on. Uh, so there is an initiative called Philemon, uh, which that did um, uh, accidentally spawn. <laughs> thanks for your question. Next question, please. Andrew, thanks for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I, I, in my naive way, I, I hadn't heard of the Alcoa story in Australia. And I just wonder why more mining companies aren't following that uh, example. Mm -hmm. You've obviously gone into it in detail. It sounds an absolutely vividly uh, successful mm -hmm. example. And if I was involved with some mining company, I'd want to know more about it. So yeah. why hasn't it been picked up? Is there something special about the circumstances of mining bauxite, which means that it's more relevant in that example than it is in many others, or what sort of uh, rationale is there? You're absolutely right. So um, mining doesn't have a very good reputation, and I think deservedly it doesn't. Uh, um, when I went to Australia, I expected to find a flaw in that story as well, and I dug and dug, and no, I, I couldn't find any. Uh, uh, they really did seem to be as good as uh, as they appeared. And uh, this is, I, I talked to people, Steve Hopper is just um, finishing up as uh, director of Q, was involved in looking at Alcoa, and he'd been active in trying to close down some mines in Western Australia, um, was, uh, you know, uh, didn't pull his punches, but he said, no, that really is as good as it looks. Um, it's an unusual situation. It's way out ahead of the rest of, uh, 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 of, uh, of the world in terms of the quality of its uh, restoration work. There are some companies that are... Um, that are moving in that direction, but I think it's fair to say that nearly all of them are some way behind. Um, and it is a pe peculiar set of circumstances. There are some commercially motivated reasons. So aluminium is, bauxite is very profitable to mine. So the profit margins are high um, for the amount of work that you have to do. Um, this place is only a couple of hours drive from Perth, so it's very much in the public eye, and that matters. Biggest city for 3,000 kilometres, so people notice what's happening to their environment. That's another part of it. There was a very uh, well orchestrated NGO campaign which pushed them in that direction. There are um, uh, certain aluminium uh, buyers, big bulk buyers of aluminium, who are linked to companies that care about where the aluminiums come from, although it's quite hard to trace. But it does mean that Alcoa can uh, sell into um, some discriminating markets, which isn't always the case for a lot of minerals. It's generally not the case, I think, and that's a big part of it. But above all of that, there is there was something extraordinary in the Alcoa boardroom, I think. And um, the more I talk to people, the more they said it's coming from the top. And there were people at the head of that organisation and still at the head of that organisation who deeply care and don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, they care for themselves and they also care because uh, a company, for companies like that, often uh, their personnel are very valuable to them. It costs a lot to replace them and people don't want to work for a bad company. Um, so, that, so, but there was, so there was some, a lot of it was to do with the bottom line, but some of it, intriguingly, didn't seem to be. How you replicate that, um, I don't know. Alcoa is busy trying to push a lot of the rest of the mining industry in that direction and is the leader of, um, uh, of, a, of a, an industry-wide initiative uh, to try and green uh, the mining industry. And actually the opportunities are there because mining is pretty profitable. So you can do that stuff and even though they spent a lot of money, it doesn't add much to the tonne of aluminium at the end of the day. Uh, so this isn't my area of expertise at all, so forgive me, but um, I have a town planner in my family who tells me that uh, despite living on a very overpopulated island, only 3% of the UK is concreted over or built on, which are, rather to me argues against the fact that we've lost 50% of our environment. Sure, we've changed it, but it's still native and it's still productive and it's still green. I just wonder whether you might comment to help me argue against him. So you're right, I think that's about right. Somewhere less than 5% of Britain is covered in concrete, that is growing. Um, uh, and the other stuff is habitat of some sort. But for most of the creatures that lived here, it's not, before we came along, it's not habitat. There are quite a few species that can live uh, in low intensity farmland. There's a few species that can live in high intensity farmland, and that's mostly what covers most of Britain. But the bulk of the species that were in Britain before we got here can't. So for most creatures, uh, that have evolved here um, and that uh, make the ecosystem function, if you like, uh, they, can't, they, they, they can't survive in those landscapes. I, I, I can't, I mean, I can, so um, most of the things that lived in uh, woodland or in wetland or whatever 
don't live on the average farm. So because it's green and it looks nice for us doesn't mean it's nice from the point of view of... If you could get into the... see, see, see through um, any of the uh, many other hundreds of thousands of species' eyes uh, to how they see the environment, it looks pretty different. Thank you, Andrew. It's uh, perhaps more of a comment than a question. Um, well, what I like about both the book and your talk is the general tone of it. I mean, I've been to many conservation lectures, and the, the lecturers often need to compete to be gloomier than thou. I mean, they seem to be saying, <laughs> you thought it was bad, but I'm here to tell you it's much, much worse. <laughs> and uh, so what I'm saying is, I think this message has to be got out beyond your book and beyond us. And I think you should do a television series, <laughs> or at least somebody should, because well, I'm serious about this, because otherwise... Uh, the only message we're getting from conservationists is how awful it all is. We have to have that message, of course. But I think it's your moment of a, at the beginning. We do need hope. And we need to think that there are things that people can do individually and that things that people are doing. So I'm just kind of reiterating what you were saying, really. But I, but I do think it needs to be... You mustn't stop here, OK? This isn't enough. <laughs> it's got to go beyond the book and beyond us. Thank you, William. Uh, no, obviously, I agree. Uh, we do need hope. Um, and there are reasons to be hopeful. And one of the things that got me thinking about this, I mean, when I was the age of my kids now, my life was, you know, the, the news, the stuff that was in the news, that there were lots of big stories that seemed to dominate your thinking growing up as a teenager in the 70s. And those things seemed equally impossible. So, you know, it was the Cold War, um, it was... Um, it, it, you know, so it was nuclear. It, it, it was a nuclear winter. Uh, there was um, apartheid. There was the Northern Ireland situation, and there wasn't an answer to any of those things. They were all impossible, and everyone would have told you they're bad and they're getting worse. And all of them got sorted out to a large extent over, over, over the last ten or fifteen years in ways that we couldn't foresee. So um, I completely agree. Uh, we, we can't give up. Uh, you could be the new David Attenborough, I suppose. No, an answer to um, William's question, it should certainly be somebody else, not me doing it, fronting it. Uh, re referring to your Kazaranga example and, that, and the Indian rhinos, is it worth, globally speaking, to save a single species with all the effort that was involved? Any comments? Uh, I think so. Um, and the people, interestingly, in Assam think so. So um, uh, uh, rhinos are in Assam still, not because we want them here, uh, in, in, in our comfortable lives, but because people in Assam really want them. Uh, poor people living around the park and people who vote in the biggest democracy in the world um, for a set of laws that enforces their protection. And if you go around Assam, um, uh, virtually everything that is Assamese that could possibly have a logo from um, the petrol station to the, um, uh, the, the local branch of the Indian Air Force, the logo is a, is a, is a rhino. People are passionate about, um, uh, about rhinos in Assam. And uh, so if they're passionate about them, that's reason enough to invest that effort, I think. Sorry, uh, mm, mm, it's not a question, it's a statement. I thought this government or the previous government had done something on conservation and natural habitats and preserving species. And you, you weren't allowed just to harvest things and plant them anywhere. Have I, is that not right? Uh, so it is true there, are, there is um, some quite good uh, conservation legislation in this country. It's not always enforced, um, and uh, it's, uh, many would argue that it's not enough to safeguard what we've got. So in this country we have uh, a smaller uh, proportion of our area covered with protected areas than almost any other country uh, in Europe. Um, yeah, because we have to negotiate with Europe, and what we think is precious to us, other countries don't necessarily agree. Well, actually, the strongest um, wildlife legislation in this country comes through for, direct from Europe. And if we didn't have European legislation, to be honest, um, we'd have lost a lot more in the last 15 years than, we, uh, th than we've... So there's hope, hope there, then? Oh, absolutely. I think, that, I think conservation in Britain is, um, it, it, it is, is very positive. I mean, at the moment, I think there's a few issues, but I think in the long-term the long trajectory, it's quite positive. Well, thank you for those questions. Just to round off with a couple of reflections based on sharing a hero with our tonight's speaker, <laughs> Norman Moore, who I've had the pleasure of working with on several occasions. First thought is that the Dorset Heath study was particularly powerful because it didn't start in Norman's lifetime. He actually used historical data to take us back a century to see how things had been before. And I think one of the difficulties we touch on tonight, and indeed one or two of the questions focused on this, is 
I, I'm looking for a really snappy phrase for it. In the Wildlife Trust, we talk about shifting baselines. The sense that we all think that the world we grew up in is how it should be, that that's the norm. And we don't realise that we actually inherited a fairly impoverished version of Cambridgeshire from our parents, and they actually grew up in a richer environment, but their grandparents wouldn't have recognised that. That if we go back generation by generation, certainly in an overpopulated country like Britain, we actually, each of us, have lost far more than we're ever aware of. So Norman's great skill was to actually look back and see what Dossities had been like, rather than saying, well, I knew the Dossities in the 1930s or 40s, that's how they ought to be. So I think we need to capture shifting baselines and work out how to get people to recognise what they've already lost. The other story about Norman which impresses me most deeply, I think, he and a few other great names like Julian Huxley, Max Nicholson, during the early 1940s, 1940, 41, 42, take, came together to start debating legislation for Britain after the war. Max Nicholson, by day, was managing the North Atlantic convoys, keeping Britain at war fed. In his evenings, he was drafting legislation for what would happen after the war. Now, this was at a time when Britain was fighting alone. It was as gloomy and desperate as the situation has ever been. And yet what came from it were the British national parks, sites of special scientific interest, and the Nature Conservancy. I love the idea that the great minds of the movement for wildlife conservation in those days, in the darkest possible time for this country and for most of Europe, could think about the natural environment as something precious and important. And I then look at the present shower, and your point about British legislation not working, I'd have to agree with. Is the present economic crisis really deeper and darker than the Second World War? When the bulk of Western Europe was overrun by the Nazis, when Britain was on the brink of failure, is that, are we really saying that we could afford revolutionary nature conservation then and we can't afford it now? I think Andrew's talk tonight has actually given us the hope. And my final request for you is if you've not read Andrew's book, do so. And you as an audience, looking around the faces I know and the faces I vaguely recognise, are people with contacts. What you've heard tonight is one of the most important things you are going to hear this year or next year. Go home, share it with your family, share it with your friends, and get the movement talking. That hope is still there, but the scariest part of the talk, I think, was we have one generation in which to solve it. 20 or 30 years, or else. The or else doesn't bear thinking about, so thank you, Andrew, for giving us that hope, and thank you to the audience for being here and listening, and please take those messages home and spread the word. Thank you very much indeed. Firstly, thank you, Brian, for chairing so expertly and for your perspectives there at the end. And, of course, um, thank you, Andrew, for an absolutely fantastic lecture this evening. I've got a small token of our gratitude for you, um, which is a guide to the hall and to the gardens. Um, the gardens are quite an interesting wildlife habitat in themselves, so um, I hope that you oh, do you very enjoy much. those very much. Um, of course, a great deal of thanks to my colleagues as well for helping with arrangements this evening. Um, and I hope that I will see many of you back here at Maddingley Hall um, in future for uh, Maddingley lectures or perhaps for a Maddingley concert um, or for some of the Festival of Ideas lectures that we have coming up uh, this autumn and studying with us. Um, so please do take away the brochures that are on your seats and also the brochures that are out on the gallery. Your programmes for this evening also detail the courses that are in some way related to this evening's lecture. So if that's your particular interest, do have a look at the programmes because that will give you a pointer towards what you might be interested in coming back here to study. Um, the next Maddingley Lecture, also the details are in your programme, but it's on the 19th of November, when Professor Colin McGinn will speak on the science of philosophy. And you'd be very welcome to join us again here at Maddingley Hall um, on the 19th of November. So that brings us to an end this evening, apart from the fact that there is tea and coffee out on the gallery.
um, and I hope those that are downstairs will join us um, for refreshments. And Andrew will be signing his book, Wild Hope. So um, there's no need to rush off. Thank you. <laughs>